Good evening, folks. Welcome. We'll get started right now. It's uh, 7 o'clock, so that's another time for a great farm and R with Practical Farmers of Iowa. My name is Luke Gran. I'm the host of Farm and R's from the PFI staff uh, here in Ames, Iowa. We're very glad to have you join us and uh, glad to have so many folks participating. I uh, just wanted to do a quick introduction from PFI and let you know some new opportunities coming up. And then we'll send it off to, to Michael Stabell of the Department of Labor, who will do, do an overview intro of uh, labor law and regulations in Iowa. And uh, then we'll pass it off to Tim and Jan from One Step at a Time Gardens, and they'll share their experiences with employees and laborers. And uh, we'll have some great questions from the audience uh, for the balance of the time. And we will, we will conclude right at 8.30. Uh, but we're very glad to have you here. Please use your chat box for questions and uh, even private conversations if you'd like to start those with uh, folks that are in the room. Uh, we're very glad to have you all with us. And one of the reasons we, we started to get involved in Farminars as, as a nonprofit organization uh, was we have a really big change of uh, changing of the guard in place right now in Iowa. Uh, farmers, when asked in 2008 uh, by the Iowa Farm and, and Rural Life Poll, 47% uh, of them said they would be, uh, retire in the next five years. So that's a lot of leadership opportunities for new people to get involved in agriculture. And we want to make sure that those folks are ready to go, have ready to hit the ground running. And we feel that farm and ours can just be one way that people can learn from each other, extend the season, if you will, on learning from farmers. So here's a photo on the screen there of a field day. Maybe think of this farm and our as an online field day where you can learn a bunch from other farmers. I see a lot of people from last year as well. So thank you for continuing your interests in farm and ours over the years. This is our third year. Uh, doing farminars. So this is our lineup heading, heading up. Uh, the, the lineup here is the employers and legal responsibilities for farmers. And we'll continue all, all the way through uh, December for the fall series and then start up again for winter in January. And please do continue to join us each Tuesday at 7 p.m. for the farminars. We also are recording these farminars, so you'll be able to watch these online on our archive, www.practicalfarmers.org slash farminar. Practical Farmers of Iowa is a wonderful organization. We love to help farmers and love to have farmers learn from each other. And the best way we feel we feel to do that is, is to let farmers be the experts and share their experiences. So uh, this is just one more example of uh, a beginning farmer sharing her story, Kate Edwards, at a field day this summer. And we're very, very excited to get to continue that kind of farmer-led work. And this is now my third year with the organization. It's been around for 30 years serving farmers in Iowa and in surrounding states. We do have many beginning farmers of all kinds. They're looking at doing all kinds of livestock enterprises and vegetables and hay and beef cattle, corn and soybeans, all the crops. So we're, we're a big tent. We have lots of input that we'd like to, to share that experience with, with everyone widely. Uh, here's Derek Roller at a, at a field day this summer. Oh, yeah, I can get you back as a presenter, no problem. Sorry to... Got a question in the chat box. One moment. There we go. Okie doke. Yeah, so Derek Roller here on the left is pointing out some things on his farm. And we'd, uh, we'd love to uh, share opportunities for vegetable farmers to get together, like at this great event coming up in Grinnell. Mark your calendars, November 26th. Practical Farmers Bio wants to ask you, Fruit and vegetable farmers, uh, what do you want us to do for you? What, uh, what are your top priorities? How can we work better for you to answer your top needs? So do attend this day if you're free. It would be a great opportunity to network with other vegetable farmers. Uh, registration is due the middle of November. So if you want to get back in touch with uh, the staffers, follow that link on your screen and say you do want to attend the Fruit and Vegetable Farmers meeting to help guide and direct uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa vegetable and fruit programming. One more opportunity to share tonight before we get started. The Next Generation Retreat is coming up. It's a great annual retreat uh, to get together with beginning farmers and share your story and learn from others. The registration is online this year. And we already have 32 registrants. So it's going to be a really great time. Lots of good networking. We'd love to have you attend as well. That's November 30th and December 1st, overnight retreat. Commuters are welcome as well. So there is on-site lodging available. But if, you, if you'd like to just come for the day, and uh, drive home at night, that's totally fine. We'll take anybody. And we'll, uh, there's still room, about, uh, uh, like I said, about 18 spots left now. 
So here we go. Let's be begin our fall series with, uh, with a great discussion on this topic. And uh, we'll start with Michael and then go to Tim and Jan. Michael, what uh, would be the preferred PDF I should open up at this point? Uh, I think, Luke, the, the one that's fact sheet number 12, Agricultural Employers under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Okay. While Michael he's doing that, I'll just job say of giving Let's have him begin. Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, I provided a few of these fact sheets from our website, so I'm not going to read them or anything like that. I'm just going to cover them briefly, but there will be great resources for, for all you folks, and welcome to everyone on this beautiful evening and election night besides, so what an exciting night. I think we'll all go home and pop some popcorn and watch the results when it's over. That's sort of what I plan to do. But um, what I want to share with you folks tonight in, in, in a rather short time frame is, is uh, a general overview of the labor laws uh, as it regards pay and uh, the child labor laws as they would apply to agricultural employers, okay? And uh, there's at the back of these web sh or, uh, fact sheets, there'll be our website and a phone number, but to start off, what I'd like to do is give you our office phone number. We're actually here in Des Moines, but our office actually encompasses all of Iowa and all of Nebraska. So if you have a question about how you should be paying one of your employees, one of your workers, I urge you to call. We have actual, our staff take turns uh, answering the phone. They're all uh, wage and hour investigators who go out in the field and, and do investigations, so they're knowledgeable folks. So I would strongly uh, encourage you to do so. And our number is area code 515-284-4625. I'll repeat that, 515-284-4625. And, and believe me when I say this, I am actually the director of the office, so I think you can probably uh, uh, take my word for it. You have no fear to call our office that, that somebody's going to put your name down as somebody that asks a question. Uh, we're out to help people comply with the laws, and that's what we're about. And if we can do it uh, without having to come and pay a visit, hey, everyone's way ahead. So you have a question, you call us. You need more information, we're here for you, okay? So in, in about 30 minutes, I'm going to hit the highlights for you. And, and my hope is you remember enough that, that when an issue comes up, you know, you can get on our website or uh, give us a call, okay? So the first uh, fact sheet that, that I want to cover very briefly is, is just this fact sheet that talks about agricultural employers. I'm talking about the federal minimum wage, overtime, record keeping, and child labor laws. Okay, and the thing you have to be very careful of on several levels as employers is, first of all, the laws are different for different types of employers. The law as it relates to you guys, this FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, is completely different than what might apply to county employees or the employees of a non-agricultural firm such as a, oh, a car dealership or a grocery store or anything like that. So don't make the mistake if you're out talking to friends who have a business or work somewhere and say, well, this is how they do it where I work, or this is how I have to do it in my business. Agricultural employers have a special place. And by and large, you guys uh, are given a lot of breaks, if you want to call it that, a lot of exceptions to the law. And, and the first thing then, very briefly, I'll chat about is, is who is subject to the law. Now, anyone who produces goods for interstate commerce is going to be subject to our law. And you notice that's the first thing it says there under coverage. Um, in theory, if you had a small operation and you sold all of your product locally, all of it, and it never left the state of Iowa, then you may not be subject to the law, okay? In addition to that provision for interstate goods, any business, any business of any type that does $500,000 a year in total sales is automatically subject to the law, okay? So if you're uh, not sure uh, whether you're subject to the law or not, you can give us a call and we'll walk you through that. But for the purposes of our talk tonight, we're going to assume everyone is, is subject to the law. So I warned you once about, you know, don't uh, assume everybody's rules are the same. The second thing I want to give you a warning about, I'm really only addressing federal laws tonight, okay? And, and in our world of laws, 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 we have federal laws and we have state laws. And the state of Iowa has its own wage laws that are not in exact sync with the federal. So um, 
do not assume that merely because you're following federal law, you know, you're necessarily following state. Generally, that's going to be the case, okay? So if you're subject to our law, what does that mean? Well, what that means is uh, agricultural employers are, are all more or less required to pay the minimum wage, which right now is $7.25 an hour, okay? So um, if you are in engaged in agriculture and whether you pay piece rate, an hourly rate, uh, however the method you pay your workers, they have to get the equal of minimum wage, $7.25 an hour, okay? That's true of everybody in, in agriculture. Now, one of the exemptions or exceptions that farmers get is from the overtime law. And uh, generally, farmers do not have to pay overtime. And let me back up a little bit, too, uh, about minimum wage and overtime. Uh, overtime is, is pretty much off the table for, for overtime. I mean, I'm sorry, for, for uh, agricultural employers, okay? If your workers are handling the products that they, uh, how do I say this, that they uh, uh, are grown on your, your farm, okay, and you hire them to come in and pick, or uh, rogue, or, or weed, or pack, or uh, run a roadside stand, or something you might do, uh, and it's all your product. You don't have to worry about overtime. Where overtime kicks in is if people are handling the goods of more than one farmer, okay? Then overtime has to come in. So please do keep that in mind. And I need to back up because I forgot one important thing about, about minimum wage. And I'm not sure if my document here gets into that. Let's see. I'm just flipping the page now. Okay. Some farmers have to pay minimum wage, but the smallest farmers do not under federal law. So you want to be aware of that as well. Well, you might say, how do we determine who's a large farmer and who's a small farmer? It's determined by how many employees you have. Okay. So um, there's a formula I'm not going to bore you with or confuse you with, but it talks about the 500 man day test. And you can see it there in the, the, the bottom uh, paragraph the, where Luke's got his little uh, arrow there for a second, now it's gone. But what does 500 man days mean? It means that if you employed the equivalent of 500 people in any calendar quarter of the previous year, then you are subject to minimum wage for the current year. Now, 500 mandates doesn't mean much. Here's what it means. It means about the equivalent of six or seven employees for about 10 weeks, okay? Now, uh, that's a good size operation, I would assume, uh, for, for a lot of what we're talking about. So if you happen to be below that level of mandates, and you only have two people that you employ, or four or five, or you might hire 10 people, but they're only with you for a couple weeks, you really don't have to worry about the federal minimum wage. And so you just want to be aware of that fact. Now, what does the state of Iowa say? I'm going to share a few things about that so that you know. The state of Iowa says, whatever wage you agree or promise to pay your employees, that's what you have to pay. So you may be somebody who doesn't have to pay minimum wage because you only have three employees. But if you hire them and say, I'm going to pay you $8 an hour, and that's the promise, verbal or written, and then for some reason you don't, then they have actually have a claim with the state. Okay? So I'm going to move along a little bit because uh, we do have to keep going on this, but I see I can, I can move this too. Um, so minimum wage and overtime, you know, generally you don't have to worry about overtime. Minimum wage only if you have the equivalent of about six uh, full-time, or not even full-time, just six employees over about a 10-week span. Okay? Let's talk about child labor a little bit then. If the people you hire are minors, and for agriculture that means under 16 or under, okay, there are an entire gamut of rules you have to follow. And I'm sure you guys are part of the, of the media uh, this year when the Department of Labor attempted to change the agricultural uh, employment for teenagers rules. Obviously those were pulled. It's, it's not, those changes are not taking effect. I'm just going to recommend if you hire teenagers under the age of 17, 16 and under, you're going to want to get your hands on our rules for child labor laws and the states as well. Because this is an arena where if you uh, run afoul of those laws, the fines are, are uh, potentially huge. A serious injury or death to a minor 
in violation of child labor laws is a hundred thousand dollar fine so it's much better to know what the rules are don't let the kids do the things they're not allowed to do rather than have them do it okay now I'm talking about employment of someone who's not in your family if you're a farmer and you own a farm and or operate a farm your own children can be employed there in any in any capacity I'm talking about non family now that does not apply to your nieces or your nephews or your uh, you know people like that just your own children okay so again please keep in mind I do have that fact sheet 40 if you want to swing by that real quick Luke and that's a, a real quick overview of what the rules are for the employment of, of uh, uh, teenagers and again I'm sorry I, I misspoke just a sec but once the minor turns 16 they can be employed in any capacity Notice what it says, youth ages 16 and above may work in any farm job at any time. So please don't make that mistake of, of not being aware of something and then uh, having a minor be found to be employed in violation because the penalties, uh, as I say, can be very, very big, okay? Um, before I move on to a couple of the other laws that, that involve the, the, the hiring of, of, for example, migrant workers, and crews that come in as, as Luca alluded to earlier I do want to take a minute okay to talk about the other fact sheet now Luke will the, these fact sheets be available to, to the folks later on the, they'll be on the website he's probably not talking now yeah we're gonna have a, a website on, on PFI's website to have uh, links to all these resources uh, in the next month or so we should have that out excellent thank you thank you okay that's great. So you can have this as, as a resource and, and you can check our website. It's chock full of information. So really keep in mind what we're talking about. Again, minimum wage, overtime, child labor. And the record keeping, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but it only stands to reason you're required by law to keep these records. So you must maintain a record of the hours worked by an employee. And that is regardless of whether they're paid by the hour or by the piece, okay, a, a, as far as for example harvesting you must to comply with federal law have a record of hours you have to keep those for a couple years two years it should should the Department of Labor ever want to come and, and visit I love that comment uh, <laughs> wish you could find somebody at minimum wage we hear that all the time and you know go to McDonald's uh, and see when the help wanted sign and see what they're paying you know they're starting people out at 859 bucks an hour in central Iowa I know that so yeah it's tough to get people it really is um, and keep in mind, you know, we're talking about the federal minimums, the federal minimum requirements. The next fact sheet, Luke, if you don't mind, is that number 13 employment relationship. In his poll, he asked about the type of people you employ, and one of his was contractors. Be aware that, that, that there are definitions, and this form actually, this sheet actually has the definition. If you're hiring someone and they're only working for you, Okay. That might be a short period of time as those seasonal employees that you mentioned might be. But if they're not working for anyone else and they might leave you and go to work for another grower, you know, down the road as the season moves on, but, but they work for you, they don't bring a lot of tools or expertise or, or skill, they're, they're laborers, they're going to be your employees. So if, if you mistakenly classify them as independent contractors, you can, not only could run afoul of the Department of Labor, but you can run afoul of the IRS and the State Department of Revenue and a whole lot of other people. And you, some of you may or may not be aware of this, but the state of Iowa has created a misclassification task force, a multi-agency group, and they're out there looking for employers of all types who misclassify folks as contractors when, uh, when they really should be employees. So if you control them, tell them when to work, tell them when to stop, tell them where to go, um, provide the tools and things like that you're going to be the employer and you want to make sure you, you understand that and the other thing too on this note of employment relationship is is the idea of interns and I know that you guys utilize those and I know practical farmers I've been on their website and seen it so you want to make sure that if you have an intern uh, and you're not proposing to pay them okay and you're in a situation where you're you're subject to minimum wage subject to maybe overtime, but minimum wage, um, it has to be an educational experience. 
Okay, it can't be just a job and call this and then, you know, you've got to have a training plan. You've got to have, and we have some documentation on this if you need it, but interns are kind of a hot topic right now, not just on the farm, but everywhere, because certain industries tend to abuse interns. I know it's a far cry from our, our group tonight, but in Hollywood, there are two or three gigantic class action lawsuits for millions of dollars against uh, some of these studios who, who literally hire people, call them interns, pay them a pittance, and then basically work their tails off. So uh, it is an issue. Just make sure you know who's your employee, who's your contractor, and if they have an intern that is in an educational plan involved in this internship. And again, I have a whole, you know, presentation on internships. So we'll we'll move along you know in that regard and and please we'll have plenty of time for questions you know at the end of the at the end of the time here so i'm watching my time because i know i get about 30 minutes now the agency that i work for department of labor wage and hour enforces 50 different laws and the minimum wage and overtime laws certainly are uh, are our bread and butter but when it comes to agriculture we have three other laws that we deal with and uh, one is called the Migrant and Seasonal Worker Protection Act. We call it MISPA for short. So if you're in a position where you hire a crew to come in, and maybe you engage a contractor, a farm labor contractor, we call them, to bring a crew of people up to harvest, to rogue, to do a lot of different things, then you, as the, as the uh, agricultural employer, uh, are subject to the rules in this MISPA Act as well. So be aware of that as well. And even though the contractor is technically, you know, the employer, many times because you're directing them, uh, you know, they can be. Uh, and Luke, you know, I'm I'm pretty much done with these right now. If you if you just want to, you can leave that up or 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 get rid of it. Makes no diff. Thanks. Um, so if you utilize these crews, just be aware of the fact that the violations that your your crew leader, your contractor may may uh, commit you can be held responsible for it too because you exert so much control over, over the workers. And these folks have to be registered, the contractors do. They have to uh, 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 disclose what the wages are going to be. You know, there's transportation provisions and, if, and there's housing provisions if you uh, are the housing provider. Now we're seeing less of that nowadays where the uh, farmer is actually providing the housing. Many times it could be a local motel or something, but do be aware of the fact that this Migrant and Work Seasonal Worker Protection Act gives uh, these migrants a lot of rights, and the promised wage is the wage that can be enforced. So if they're recruited down in Texas and promised a wage of $12 an hour and they get up here, uh, they have to get $12 an hour, okay? And again, there are record keeping provisions uh, and things like that. We actually do inspect housing as well to make sure it's safe and clean and has proper sanitation, water, you know, things like that. Probably even bigger though is what we call field sanitation. So if you bring these crews in, it, it is someone's responsibility, either user, yours or the contractor or both, to provide certain things in that field. Porta potties, uh, drink, drinking water, hand washing facilities, things like that. So. Um, Believe me, uh, the folks who utilize these workers all the time uh, have a lot of hoops they have to jump through. In Iowa, we see some of these. By far, the largest number of folks come into Iowa to detassel. And folks like Monsanto and Pioneer have these farm labor contractors bring up big crews of people to detassel corn. So um, be aware of that law, too, because it is it is it uh, can come to bear on you, OK? Um, there are fines for that law and back pay and all kinds of things like that. The last one I was going to chat about very briefly is another law called H-2A, and it's very similar to the MISPA Act. And that's when uh, growers bring up uh, people under a special visa, and they, they already have their visa when they come across the border. And there's a million hoops to jump through there, too. And those wages are predetermined by the U.S. Department of Labor. So uh, you make application to bring these workers up, and you're told what the wage you have to pay is. And in order to avail yourself of that, uh, you have to show that there are no local workers available uh, for this work. So I know I'm going rather quickly, and I know i got a lot of stuff to cover, but let me cut to the chase. What happens if somebody uh, messes up on one of these laws? Well, I already mentioned there can be fines 
we call them penalties, civil money penalties, for the employment of minors in violation, for the employment of migrants in violation, and the same in these H-2As. And then if the wages were not paid correctly, for example, if an employee who should have gotten minimum wage did not, we will, uh, if we find out or if we do an investigation, we will um, actually compute the amount of back pay that would be due these folks, and the employer is obligated to pay that to the employee, not to the government, not to the Department of Labor, but to the employees. So, and that's true, um, you know, regardless of the employee's status as a minor, an adult, as a migrant, as a citizen, even as an illegal alien, they're entitled to the, the back pay that they that they uh, are entitled to, and that's a Supreme Court case. So uh, the liability time frame for these laws is typically two years. So you can be held liable for what happened over the past two years with your, uh, with your uh, staff. So the, the one thing I think I would just emphasize to, to everyone on the call, no one can be an expert in this. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I learn stuff new every day. So to expect folks like you to be up to speed on it is a bit much. But you certainly have our phone number. You certainly can get on our website, and, and we are more than happy to assist. So anytime you have an issue. By the way, anything you need in the way of a poster, there are posters required you know, for minimum wage and things, uh, or a booklet about any of these rules, the child labor rules, MISPA Act, Fair Labor Standards, whatever, all you have to do is make us a call and we will send that out to you. We have all those stocks here. You can also order them online. All of it's free. All of it's free. So um, I'm a tad ahead of schedule, but I know we'll have plenty of time for question and answers. So uh, that covers most of what I wanted to chat about for now. So I'll just turn it over to back to Luke. Thank you, Mike. Well done. I know there's a lot of questions out there, so let's uh, keep those written down. We'll go to Jan and Tim, and they'll share their experiences and lead us into questions. Very good, Luke. Uh, thank you. This is Tim Landgraf, and I'm going to start off this evening for our portion, and uh, then we'll move into what Jan's going to talk about. And uh, just, I guess, for my part, I'm going to give a little introduction of uh, where we're at, who we are, what we do, and some of our hiring history. And then Jan's going to cover some of the practices that we do and some of the materials we've assembled and used in our hiring practices. So to give you a, a bit of an overview, we're in north central Iowa, and we're about 75 miles straight north of Ames in southern Hancock County near a little town called Kanawa. Uh, we've been farming since 1996, and that makes uh, this year our 17th year of production. And our primary production has been in uh, community-supported ag vegetable production. For those of you who may not know what CSA production is, it involves uh, people buy a farm share for a set fee, and they receive and exchange a box of vegetables each week during growing season. Uh, we also have some targeted wholesale production of vegetables and a small amount of restaurant sales. We do produce some broiler chickens on clover. It's a pasture poultry model. We have some raspberry production. And we're currently at about eight acres of vegetables and chickens in production. So on to our employee history. Um, the first few years we were in operation, we really had no employees besides Jan and myself. We started out fairly small. And our hiring of outside labor began as the farm business grew. We started with local high school youth. Um, these were students or youth that we hired working part time during the summer um, as we needed help. Usually one person per, per summer for the first few years. And then as our own children got older, we have two children. Uh, they also began working on the farm for a set wage. And then as the business grew, we began hiring area adults on a part-time basis. Uh, usually they worked a couple of days each week during the growing season, as well as for if we had some larger jobs that we needed them for several days in a row as needed, we would have them um, do that also. Um, we have offered work exchange for a couple of our farm members. In other words, what they do is in exchange for receiving their, their farm membership of vegetables. Uh, they work a couple of days each week during the growing season. We track the work hours for the time that they work at, at a set wage that's uh, agreed upon, and we determine 
when they work that share cost off, and then at that point, uh, then we pay a wage rate for the hours worked over the cost of their share. Um, yeah, in about uh, 2003, we started working with an ISU program, an Iowa State uh, program called Life in Iowa. And this was a program which partnered college-age students at Iowa State that were enrolled in the College of Agriculture at Iowa State, and they were partnered with ag-related businesses in Iowa. And the college students received credit at, at ISU, as well as a stipend from the business that they were working for. Uh, they had to work 30 hours per week at the business, and then they did 10 hours a week doing community service in the local community. And we did this program three years, and through that program, we began to understand the role the farm could play, um, not only in growing vegetables, but in educating young people regarding the role of agriculture um, as we, um, our type of agriculture within the scope of agriculture in Iowa. And then starting in 2006, which is when the ISU program ended, we began hiring trainees uh, from really all over the U.S., um, as well as continuing with our local part-time employees. And we've had a total of 14 folks. Um, again, they've come from all over the U.S., California, New York, Texas, uh, just to name a few of the states. And uh, these folks have come to us through colleges, uh, contacts at various colleges, as well as through ATRA. ATRA is the appropriate technology transfer for rural uh, rural areas. And uh, their website, I'm going to give that to you quick. If you don't know it, atra.ncat.org. Um, and there's a there's a space within ATRA for posting of, of uh, the trainees or, or interns or whatever term you want to use um, on farms. So it's a place for... Uh, folks to come that are interested and folks to post that actually have uh, dual offerings. And Jan's going to talk a little bit about through that um, of you know what our system is um, for hiring those folks and what we do, some of the materials we've put together. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jan. Great. Good evening. So I'm going to be covering both the legal responsibilities, which is the background and focus of this um, webinar, and going to be reviewing some of our practices in the light of the issues that Mike has particularly talked about. But I'm also going to talk about some of our practices that I might say is sort of beyond legal. There are tools that we've developed that we think are important in our relationship with our employees. And sort of, you know, Mike, uh, being as gracious as he was to say he's not an, ex an expert, we're far from that. And so I wanted to just uh, lift up some of the resources that we've used in some of our um, trying to understand some of our expectations and responsibilities. So I hope that uh, folks are aware of the book that Neil Hamilton put out uh, quite a while ago at this point called The Legal Guide for Direct Farm Marketing. It looks like maybe Luke is going to put that up there. This was published in June of 1999 by the Drake um, by Drake University. So that's a good resource. I know at um, the Moses workshops up in La Crosse in either late March or early, uh, excuse me, late February, I've been sort of trying to keep track of some of the workshops that they offer relating to managing employees and so forth. So. I've been sort of following some of those resources and following um, articles that come out, well, particularly through uh, growing, what's that new letter we get? Growing for Market. Growing for Market. So those are a couple of the resources <coughs> that we have found <coughs> useful. Excuse us, if you can hear some rattling in the background, our dog is having a great time with a bone. <laughs> um, so as Tim said, our crew is a mix of hourly part-time local friends and farm members and seasonal full-time, at least while they are here, on-farm trainees, uh, young people who are seeking experience with sustainable farming, um, be that for more of a broad sociological interest or really from a new beginning farmer interest. And the photo you're looking at is a collection of our crew our crew is not that big every season. In um, a couple of years ago, the farm celebrated our 15th anniversary, and we invited interns 
um, past trainees to come back and join us, and then members of our crew at that point. So you can see it's a pretty diverse group of people. Um, our kids are in the picture um, at the far left, Andrew, Je yeah, Andrew with the green arrow and Jess with the green arrow. They are both um, away from home and off of our crew at this point in time. Um, Luke's lovely wife, Sally Grant, is in the lower left, and she worked here as one of her steps toward their burgeoning um, experiences at Tabletop. So it, that's, it's really great to see that maybe we've played a tiny role in some of these young people getting into farming. We certainly don't take lots and lots of credit, but we certainly had an opportunity to connect with them. I want to look at the young woman in the center who has the stripe on the center and the bottom. A short hair, yep, that's Mallory. And Mallory went on to work, I mean, well, I won't get to too far, but she didn't stay into farming. She's really more interested in sort of the organizing side of agriculture. And uh, we have a young woman who is currently working at the policy level in Washington, D.C. that spent a summer here. So we really have quite a range of folks, um, as well as you can see adults, and we've got some kids that have been involved. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the minimum wage. <clears throat> so the hourly part-time local folks are working for a cash hourly wage, or as Tim was describing, we do some bartering with them to uh, cover the expense of their share, and then we track and pay cash wage for the balance of the season. The, se the seasonal full-time on-farm trainees compensation is a combination of a cash stipend um, balanced with the, the value of the room at a small house on the farm, so we provide lodging on the farm, and we offer partial board with the farm providing um, some meals during the week and access to extra produce as is available through the season. So we we credit and, and account some of the values of both the lodging and the board. Um, all right. Yeah, I, I've seen that there's <coughs> a little bit of discussion on the chat box about um, hourly wages and trying to be competitive in your communities. And that's an issue that we look at every um, year when we're working on our budget to try to keep our wages at a point where we are competitive with um, the opportunities that folks might find around in our communities. In terms of overtime, our workday is running from 8 till 5, Mondays to Fridays, and we take, we take breaks so that we've got about an eight-hour day. And we try to keep pretty clear to that schedule um, <clears throat> and don't schedule trainees on Saturdays unless it's an exception. So we try to watch those hours fairly closely. But we all know that some farm tasks run longer. Um, not for the local folks. They follow a pretty strict uh, cutoff of hours. But the trainees who are living on farm are the ones who are a little bit likely to get into some longer hours. And that's maybe um, when we were doing farmer's markets, it certainly fell into that. We didn't do any farmer's market this summer. Um, but when we're doing CSA deliveries, that usually encro encroaches on the hours as well. So record keeping is really important. All of our employees have an account on a farm computer where they log in their hours and then they keep track. Um, we are paying them bi-monthly. They just give us, I've got a slip that they give us their reported hours. And then when I return that slip, um, it lists for them their hourly wage, the gross wage, the uh, withholding of Social Security and Medicare, and then their net pay. So they have just sort of an ongoing record through the season. And, you know, I usually jot a note of thanks to them. Now with the trainees, the agreement for them is to work the 40 hours a week schedule, but um, we ask them to keep track of their hours because sometimes they may be a little over, sometimes a little under, and that way, if they're tracking their hours steadily through the season, when we wrap everything up at the end of their time on the farm, we can be very clear that we've been fair with them and they've been fair with us in how all of the, the pay and the time has balanced out. So we try to be pretty careful about that. 
um, in some of the other paperwork that we have to deal with, uh, all new employees complete I-9 forms, and I keep that on file. Uh, employees fill out W-4s at the beginning of the season, and then we file W-2 forms to everybody by the end of each January. We are withholding the Social Security and Medicare taxes, and then we're making electronic payments monthly on our during our wage season. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about child labor law. We have had farm member families with younger children that work here. So sort of like Mike described, um, paying attention to that, we've either had a parent that's working alongside those kids, or we've gotten a signed note of permission for the parents approving of the child's work on the farm, and we keep that on file. Um, so that's a real quick run through of uh, sort of how our practices are following along some of the issues that Mike lifted up. In this picture, um, probably when we start to talk about tools beyond legal, most of our tools have been developed around the trainees who have worked on the farm. So we take a pretty deep look at how the farming experience provides a hands-on opportunity, but also a heads opportunity. So the slide here was this summer, Tim sitting down with Julia and Ben, who were living and working on the farm, and they were looking over some of the spreadsheet systems that we um, keep and use as some of the guides and tools for managing our business. Um, Julia now is getting ready to start her own business down in the Ames area called Lacewing Acres. Um, last summer we had um, a couple that actually spent two years on the farm and they weren't that familiar with uh, some of the spreadsheet systems we were using. So, you know, we provided them some templates to help them get their own systems started. And um, Genesis and Eli are now in the Indianapolis area in Indiana and have started a full hand farm. So it's really fun to see these young people. Um, you know, they inspire us and they teach us a lot while they're here, but they also pick up a few things and then they take off with all of their knowledge and passion and skills and, and they take off in exciting new directions. Um, just in basic tools of hiring, you know, we've got a basic outline and, and description of what the job is so that we make that available and post that um, and follow up with any inquiries. Um, you know, I remember at the beginning of talking with people about what kinds of questions are critical interview questions uh, so that you're really getting at the information you need. Um, here we have Genesis and Eli on the left. They are the ones now in Indianapolis and then Brian is one of our local part-time folks who is a teacher in uh, Clarion, just 15 to 17 miles south of us. So I've developed a set of interview questions that um, have been pretty good and pretty consistent between applicants, so I can kind of compare information more accurately. And then some basic but very effective reference check questions. So those are kind of helpful. Um, and more so a checklist to trainees. And this is all about being very clear about expectations, about what you can offer your employees and what you can't offer your employees. And I have to say I developed the checklist after some painful lessons of probably suggesting that we could offer certain things, particularly in terms of some of the educational opportunities that ended up not being very realistic. So I have a long checklist and I go over that when I have an interview with um, interns and uh, you know I keep a record that I talked to this intern on you know, such and such a date, and yes, we covered this detail and this detail and this detail. Well, the interviews are fairly long and in-depth, but the feedback I get from the interns is that they are very clear about what the experience is going to be like and uh, usually answers most of their questions. So they have that. When they arrive then, we lay out an intern um, agreement, and that that articulates you know, what their job is, what their compensation is, and an evaluation process. Um, we, we ask them, as, as these trainees, to set themselves some goals, and then we review those with them. So it's kind of an early evaluation, sort of check review over the goals. 
then we schedule a mid evaluation in the season to sort of see how are we doing on keeping track on these goals. And then we do um, a closing evaluation to get some feedback from them as well. So the, the trainee agreement lays all of that out and has a place where we can track that, yes, we have taken care of the paperwork. They have had the opportunity to articulate their goals. We've reviewed those. We've reviewed midway through the season. We've reviewed at the end of the season. Um, that's been particularly helpful. And then we have developed a trainee handbook. And that, again, lays out um, you know, what we expect for them in terms of preparing to come here. Um, you know, just how does the farm work? How does the little house that they're going to live in work? What are our policies around tobacco and drugs and liquor and visitors and personal and sick time? And just going through a lot of how does everything work here and put it in writing. Um, anybody that's been working on any farm food safety um, plans and any other kinds of sort of documenting how you do your work. Uh, it could well be anybody with organic certification is along those same lines. It's just important to be able to document and articulate how you do things. Very, very important, I think, to keep those expectations clear. I guess, you know, ultimately that's what the legal um, uh, expectations have all been because historically not everybody has been held accountable to how they care for employees as part of their crew and the laws are in there to try to, to take care of those employees. So I look at the tools that we've developed in addition to some of the, the sort of legal based practices, the tools being there to help um, hopefully make that the most effective uh, experience for the people working on the farm as well as for us. Because if we're clear about what we're expecting and, and how things work, then we're all more ready to uh, get on to the work at hand and hopefully not getting tripped up in confusion um, and uh, any sorts of conflict. So that's a quick review from us. Um, and I think maybe, Luke, we might turn it back to you and see what kinds of questions and discussions we can uh, move into from there. Excellent. Let's see what the participants can, can throw at these experts now with all this experience. It's so interesting to hear that Mike uh, feels like 30 years at this, he's still not an expert. And to hear 17 years is farming and still not an expert, it's, it's very interesting. It's a learning experience. May I go ahead and answer, Luke? You okay with that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, the question about interns, that's a good one because that leads me to a point I wanted to make after listening to Jan. Um, you know, the intern situation is, is, is one that's, from a political standpoint, it's kind of a hot issue. And, and uh, the Department of Labor is not wanting to squash, you know, internship uh, uh, opportunities, and yet they don't want these interns to be taken advantage of. But if the intern is, is uh, just there of their own volition and they're not part of a study plan through uh, an educational institution or anything like that, you're probably going to have to pay them a wage. And, and if they're entitled to minimum wage, yes, the room and board does count towards that. And that was my point in relation to Jan, which by the way was, was very impressive as far as what you do for records and how you handle your employees on every level. But the, the, the idea of the value of what you provide your, your workers, if you're providing them room and board, there is a value to that and that counts towards a wage just like a cash amount. And I think what Jan was describing was absolutely right on, that they figure the value of the, the room, the board, the other things they may provide. And then if that still doesn't equal the wage they're trying to get to, whether it's minimum wage or whatever, they would kick in the difference then in the form of, 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 of a wage, a paycheck or cash, whatever. So do keep that in mind. Now the theory behind the law is that the employer doesn't make a profit off of what they provide. So if you provide food to your, to your workers, and it costs you whatever it costs you, that's the credit you get towards the wage. You don't get to make a profit off that. 
but all the things you provide to people, uh, it, it goes towards that wage amount. So that's the key to remember. What amount do you tax? Okay, good question. Uh, I'm not a tax advisor. However, I believe that the correct answer to that is the, the total value of what you're paying them. So if you're figuring what are the wages I need to compute taxes on, you do have to include the value of that lodging, mm -hmm. of that board, of the uh, you know other perks you might you might provide. And I, I'm sure IRS agrees. You, you would have to figure like that. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, what do you what what, do you, what is your record keeping look like? You're doing it, Jan. I, I've seen samples, but what what did you say? <laughs> Right, right. Well, I think that's probably one a weak piece in our strategy at this point. I mean, we could certainly document the number of days that they were here and the number of meals. Um, we probably couldn't document those zucchinis. And uh, <laughs> as we've gotten into this conversation with Luke on a side committee that PFI has been working on um, called Labor for Learning, and I don't know, Luke, you may want to touch base on that just a little bit. It's probably um, given us some uh, more material to think about on this. So, yeah, I would say that we we look at um, uh, the basic, uh, an estimation of the value of the lodging. We look at an estimation of the meals we think they're going to have, and we do calculate that against the cash and know that the whole package together is more than minimum wage. Um, but I think if push comes to shove, we don't have a real hard basis at this point uh, that we could report on. So we might need to look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm going to sound like the federal bureaucrat that I am, but you know the old cliche, document, document, document. And, and yes, I, yes. I really, I, I can't <laughs> tell you how many employers in my career I've encountered that basically had the right idea and basically were doing things right, but they have to be able to prove that they're doing yeah. it right. And I know that sounds harsh, but I'm telling you folks, it's real, okay? I'm, I'm a guy who okay. just says it like it is. So, so that's Mike, what you got to know. Help us think about how, what, what is some uh, practical, effective uh, documenting when you are doing things like, um, well, there happens to be a lot of extra kale this week, or, you know, you know there's some simple tools. You know, <laughs> common sense is, is still the best tool, you know. So if you know what the market value of kale was, and you know your market value includes a little bit of profit, and you back off your profit margin, you know, and I don't know what the price of kale is a pound, but, you know, if you knew it was, uh, you know, $4 a pound, and you're making 10%, and you give people some, some of that, just back off your profit margin, and, and, and the credit you get towards wages is, is basically the cost of producing that, that good. The house, I think you had a good idea. And, and you know what, if you're in the ballpark, I can speak for my staff, I think, I'm in a good position, that they're going to take uh, the good faith uh, efforts you know, that you would, would put forth uh, you know, at, at their value. If you're right, saying, well, that right. kale's worth $48 a pound and that's what I'm, you know, I gave my people some, you know, that's not going to fly. Or that little farmhouse that, you know, rents for, you know, 500 a month and you're, you're saying, well, it's worth 1000 a month for wage purposes. No, you know, that's not going to fly. So be reasonable and, and, and have some basis if, if the Department of Labor ever came to visit you. Now, are we out visiting folks like you? Not very often. But we get complaints, guys. We do. We get complaints every day. Somebody calls in here with a complaint about not being paid properly. And we do have to go out and check it out. If you can defend what you're saying uh, along the lines of what I said, if you provide a lunch, you know, it's a sandwich, and, you know, we all know what lunch costs. You can go down to McDonald's and get a lunch for five bucks. You know, that's pretty reasonable. Uh, but just don't, don't, don't get out of line. So um, that would be my take on it. And we don't really have forms, per se. Um, yeah, I, I like right. that point that... Uh, Wilbur made about, you know, is it sellable? If it's junk and, and it's crap and you're going to pitch it anyway, it's probably not worth anything for the purposes of wages. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but I could certainly yeah. see some uh, developing some logs to, to document some of that a little more accurately. I do believe so. Now, if somebody, you know, takes a carrot and munches on a carrot, you know, who really cares? Oh, but yeah. if, if you're really in the position where you're claiming, you know, this meal or this lodging or whatever, you really want to do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> they got some good humor out there. Right, well, I'm going right, to go ahead right. and jump on. Yeah, I'm going to jump on this other one about the contractors being registered. Good. Good. Um, you can go on to the uh, Wage and Hour website and, and those little sheets that are on the uh, uh, thing. But I'll I'll give you the website real quick, uh, just so you have it. It's uh, www dot wage hour one word wage hour dot dol dot gov wage hour dot dol dot gov and that'll access and you can just search it. You can do all kinds of things. But we have a, a website where you can check a, a farm labor contractor's registration status. And then I think on that website there's a 1-800 number you can call as well. So you can you can also ask them to produce their card because every farm labor contractor who's registered in the U.S. is provided with a registration card, and that's probably the easiest. And 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 make sure it's up to date. There's dates on it and everything. But between looking at the card and uh, going to our website, you can double check, uh, uh, you know the. Uh, whether they're registered or not. Because here's the thing, and that was a great question because we just had a case turned in that I looked at yesterday where the grower um, didn't bother really to check and turns out had several FLCs, we call them for short, and two of them weren't registered. So there was a penalty there. There was a fine for that. So uh, in that case, it went against the farm labor contractor, but sometimes you can go against the, the, the grower too. So you want to be careful about that. Absolutely. Um, H2A visas. Okay, um, the best source of that, I'm going to give you another website. It's basically the same as ours, but just DOL.gov. DOL.gov is the Department of Labor's overall website. And the people who um, um, provide all the paperwork in order to get H2A workers is another division of the Department of Labor. Not the one I work for, that's wage and hour. But the one you want to look for is ETA, Employment Training Administration. And the way it works is ETA, in conjunction with ICE, issues the visas and the paperwork that enable growers to bring in these H-2A workers. And this paperwork is very specific. What are you going to have them do, specifically? Where are they going to work? How long are they going to work? All this paperwork gets filled out. You get it. Then you bring your workers in. You're good to go. But ETA, yep, Employment Training Administration, on the DOL gov website has all the data you need uh, to uh, research that and uh, the documents, the forms, you know, the whole nine yards. So it's a cooperative effort. They set the program up. If there's a problem, all the standards that go with H-2A, we have to go check it out. The registration goes through ETA, wage hour enforces all the labor standards. Uh, you're welcome. <sighs> Mike, do you see the question? Is contract labor the same as day labor? Hmm. I'm sorry, I missed that. Thank you. I'm looking at these right here. I got fixated on the free hamburgers, but you know, I, I couldn't get off that. Uh, <laughs> you know, here's my take, guys. And, and now this is Mike talking. This isn't the United States Department of Labor. Um, the term contract labor is really a misnomer. You know that implies that I can contract somebody to come and work for me. You know, pay them anything I want, not worry about the taxes. They're contract labor. You know, technically that doesn't exist. Okay, they're either an employee or they're a contractor. Okay, in some cases you may have an intern. Okay, they're not an employee. They don't have that employment relationship. So um, day labor and contract labor, and, and of course you guys have all seen it on TV, or maybe you've even seen it, where you know the pickup pulls up to the corner, and there's a bunch of guys lolling around in the corner, and somebody says, "Hey, I need a deck. Who wants to come?" And they jump in the back of the truck, and they you know go build the deck, and then they drop them back off, pay them cash, and that's day labor or contract labor. That is as illegal as it gets, and and we don't have a huge problem with it in Iowa, but I know a lot of my peers in cities like Dallas and, and uh, Phoenix and Miami, it's a constant problem. And those workers are employees, they're entitled to minimum wage, they're entitled to overtime, you know, and the same is true you know, to the extent those things apply on the farm. So my take is contract labor and day labor both just don't get hung up on those. They're either employees or, or, or they're contractors. Okay. I had a quick comment if I may jump in here. So sure. with all the bad news you hear about, you know, people abusing migrant laborers and it just seems like we hear a lot of that kind of uh, discussion, you know, like slavery in Florida and the tomato fields, et cetera. Um, you know, should we 
my, I guess my personal inclination is to, to try to avoid those kind of uh, visa arrangements, you know, H2A or whatever. But is, you know, is your, do you have experience with those? Like, are there good operators that uh, are, you know, the, the, there's some isolated incidents that the slavery is happening and, and, you know, H2As can be used for good? Well, you know, the, the, the more egregious stories, uh, uh, and, and not stories, but realities of that, do tend to come from places like Florida and, and other places down south. We've seen, seen some out in California in the Central Valley and stuff like that. You know, my experience is, it's like everything else, you have your good and, and your bad players. We have a, a group of attorneys now in Iowa who specialize in, in, in migrant and farm worker issues. And, and some of them help uh, employers, you know, and focus on employers, and others focus focus on, on the workers. But no, I think there's some good ones. I think there are farm labor contractors who do this year after year after year and they bring up a crew. Many times the crew is almost identical every year and, and you know they come, they go, everything is just peachy. And then other times we get, you know, uh, what I would characterize fly by night, you know, operators. And uh, but as far as the very egregious, you know, involuntary servitude and all that stuff, I can tell you that in my 30 years, and I've been fortunate to spend my whole career here in Iowa, all over the place, not in Des Moines, but all over. And I know of one case, one case, where there was a, a allegation of, of, of involuntary servitude. And it wasn't even migrant workers, it was a, a you know a, an egg place. And uh, it never panned out, but I, I believe there were things going on. There workers were being locked in there at night and stuff like that. But uh, no, I, I think, Luke, honestly, those things occur, but I think in these parts, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but, but the folks in Iowa and Nebraska, the Midwest, just kind of have a good, solid moral base, and I can't see too many folks. I don't encounter too many folks I would think would, would ever go, go down that road, you know, as employers. But may I just say this, if any of you are contemplating the use of this, you do probably want to check out your FLC pretty closely, because um, uh, there's good ones and there's bad ones, and check their card, get online, see if they got references, you know, and check it out because um, I'll tell you, uh, they can get you in trouble because they can screw up and then you wind up being liable. And just let me give you one example of that and I'll get to the next question. For years, uh, come uh, um, detasseling time, we would be bombarded with complaints of people who were brought up here, they worked, and their, their boss, the contractor, skipped out with the payment from Pioneer or Monsanto or one of those and didn't pay the workers. And now they're stuck here, they got no money, they got no way to get anywhere. Well, what Pioneer and Monsanto, all the big boys started doing is they started paying the workers directly. And then they subtracted that out of their payment to the contractor, and the contractor got the difference. That way, the Monsantos and the pioneers of the world were, were clean. They were good. And, and you know, the, there was no incentive then for the farm labor contractor to skip out uh, with all the money, with all the money. And we haven't had a problem like that, I bet you, in 15 years. Uh, Pioneer, bless their hearts, were the, were the people who started that, and pretty much all the other big players got on board. But uh, just be careful is all I can say. Unfortunately, we don't have, and we're not allowed by law to give you, like if you call me up and said, hey, Mike, I've got this contractor. Do you have a history of violations with him? You know, it's all Privacy Act. I, I, I'm not enabled to tell you. But um, unemployment insurance, um, you know, that is not my arena. So I, I'm going to have to beg off that one. I know that's a hot topic, but I really don't know. Iowa Workforce Development, IWD, they have a great work site, or website too, and you could check out with them. That would be your, your, uh, you know, course. So you've heard stories about uh, people, this involuntary servitude in Iowa, huh, Melissa? Apparently. Wow. A lot of that stuff is very, very difficult to to uh, find because if somebody's trying to make that happen, they they hide and hide and hide. And uh, oh, vineyards, interesting, interesting. Hmm, something to keep in mind for the future. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just not an expert or, or knowledgeable about unemployment in any in any way. So.
I'm going to get up and dance, and maybe they'll uh, they'll send in some more great questions. Well, I keep seeing um, all this multiple multiple typing. Okay. <laughs> I guess one one question, you know, there's kind of like this unwritten rule. It seems like I've dug through some of the the the, the law about it. There's like this unwritten six hundred dollar rule. Like, if if you don't pay someone more than six hundred bucks in wages in a year, then you don't really have to do the withholding. Do you know if that's something that's ever come across your your desk? I have heard that as well, and, and what I can tell you is I know there is a pay threshold below which you, you know you don't need to to, to withhold, uh, and you don't need to submit the you know the, all the paperwork, do do the W two or anything like that. I'm not so sure it's 600 anymore. I think it may have gone up. I think it might be like 900 now. I you know I, that again I don't know. I know there is a threshold below which you don't have to worry about it. But it's not very much, and if you have somebody who works for you for probably two weeks, they're probably going to make that kind of money. So you want to keep that in mind. Ah, ten or more employees. In. Now it depends on whether you're talking about for tax purposes and withholding, you know, the IRS, or whether you're talking about unemployment insurance for for Iowa workforce. And, and I don't know what Iowa workforce says. I know IRS has that 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 floor, if you will, of of wages under which you don't have to worry about it. Why are there so many confusing uh, rules with labor regulations, in your view? <laughs> and you asked me that on election night, Luke. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons, okay, and, and I'm going to give you some personal ones. One is you've got the whole interaction between state laws and federal, okay? Now, Iowa in my opinion, is about a middle-of-the-road state for, for the, 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 the number of labor laws they have, uh, how strict they are, and then how hard they enforce them. You know, I look at Nebraska has virtually nothing. Minnesota has a state law that, that is as restrictive or more so in almost every arena than, than the federal. So it just depends on your state. So you got that. Number two, I think that, that you've got a um, issue you know, workers and protecting the rights of workers that, that, that all politicians to a lesser or greater degree can get on board with. So there's not much aversion to passing a new law. Hey, let's do family medical leave. Let's give everybody time off for their medical problems or their mom and dad's medical problems, you know. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but now nursing mothers have to be allowed time at work to express their breast milk by law, by federal law. Well, and I'm not going to get political, I really won't, but I believe it's a uh, area of the law that most everybody, n nobody has really strong feelings against. So, so the politicians and, and both state and federal just tend to put a lot of laws out there. Uh, and uh, the confusing aspect of it, boy, I, that's that's hard to say. I think it's just the fact that you know they go way back. I mean, the FLSA was 1938, so that's a lot of years to pile rule on rule on rule on rule until it just gets overwhelming. It's about the best I could say for that. What do you say, Jan and Tim? Could you share your checklists on the PFI website? Huh? I mean, the checklist is pretty straightforward, but it is. Um, specific to our farm, you know, so one could look at that and figure out how they would adapt it to their own farm. Yeah, I would, I would be happy. It's just been through the process of thinking through the uh, this whole question about what we can offer and what we can't offer and trying to be pretty clear about what our arrangements that we're proposing to these trainees is all about. So, so Luke, why don't we... Why don't we talk, and why don't we talk to you about that, or whether we put it on the website, or whether that's something we, um, if people send us an email and we then return to them, if we handle it that way. Well, well let's talk about that a little bit. Another document I'm going to just, on a side note, refer people to, you know, there were some questions earlier about, um, 
this withholding. There's a circular that's put out by the IRS. It's Circular A, Agriculture Employers Tax Guide. They put it out every year, updated every year. Um, so if you just look that up on the IRS website, and it goes through the requirements for, you know, what's the minimum threshold for um, whether you have to do withholding, um, you know, and then all the formulas for calculating um, what that withholding is and how often you have to do it and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty, pretty thorough, typical IRS type document. So there's, it's fairly thick, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's pretty helpful. Agriculture Employers Tax Guide. The publication number from the IRS is publication 51. I'm going to comment about the workers' comp things. Yeah, again, that's that's Iowa Workforce Development handles workers' compensation in the state of Iowa, and, and we uh, basically run from that <laughs> issue every time we can. So that would be again something you'd have to touch base with with uh, IWD if if you're in Iowa. No federal regulations. Uh, no, workers' comp, um, there are certain situations where the feds have stepped in uh, for work comp on employees who go state to state and stuff. But no, workers' comp, by and large, is left up to the states. And that's why the rates can vary widely from state to state of what, what, what you have to pay for that. But no, that's 100% handled in our arenas here. That's 100% handled by the state. No federal regs on that at all. Okay. You know, I want to add a thing, if I may, have a little bit of break here. I don't want to. I don't want to squash any other questions, but I didn't say one thing. Uh, uh, you really do, because it kind of ties into this work comp and injuries on the on the job. Um, we've had three teenagers die in Iowa this year, and uh, they're spread all over. And 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 I'll tell you, in my world, when we have to investigate those, those are the absolute worst of the worst. And. Uh, We've got a case right now. We're just doing where a kid cut his finger off at work, a young boy, a young man. And uh, for heaven's sakes, I, it's just so, so, so important. You've really got to watch that. And, and I know it became very politicized, but I'm sure most of you realize that, that um, or if you don't, I'm going to tell you, um, Farming uh, is a very dangerous occupation, but amongst teenagers, it is the number one occupation with risk for injury per hour worked. Okay, so you just really want to be careful when it comes to employment of teenagers, and be very careful that they're you know you can trust them, you, you know you, they know what they're doing, uh, and the bottom line is if it's powered, if it's a piece of power equipment, and they're under 16 years of age, you really need to have to watch out. And, and I can't emphasize enough, you definitely need to get um, the publications uh, that the Department of Labor has and that Iowa Division of Labor has in regards to the employment of minors. It, it will pay you back a hundred, a thousand fold. Uh, and uh, the worst thing is to have a young person get hurt in your employ and then look at, number one, your work comp bill go through the roof and look at the uh, Department of Labor show up and want to levy some $20,000 fine on you. And then we're not even talking about the civil civil suit. So, um, that that is just huge to be sure you're up to speed on all that. So, um, oh, <laughs> you know, I was afraid. I, I was hoping I could get through this without the volunteer thing. Um, volunteers is a really sticky issue, folks, and, and and the reason is it goes back to what I was saying about interns. It, it, DOL is in a lose lose situation. So what happens is, you know, they're afraid to really go too far in any direction. So we don't have a lot of, of stuff out there on volunteers. But, you know, if you have someone volunteer for something you would normally pay somebody to do, um, they're, they're probably technically entitled to pay for that job. Are we going out and look for it? No. I mean, I see the papers where these wineries call for volunteers to come and stomp the grapes and do all this stuff all the time. And I even got a call from the state one time, the State Division of Labor, saying, hey, are you guys going to go out and investigate that? And I said, no, we're not. You're not going to get into that. But, but do be very careful of that, okay? Um, 
if I gave you the book answer, I would say you really can't have volunteers without paying them. I mean, that's the book answer. But if you're a small operation, you're not subject to minimum wage and overtime, hey, you know, you're not really going to have a big problem if you don't have those, those you know, six or eight workers uh, that you would have. So just be very, very careful on volunteers. They never complain, but, but theoretically it could happen. I'm going to address that next question, too, the target of investigation. Um, when, when the investigation process begins, uh, depending on the situation, it may just be the investigator will show up on the property. And in agriculture, that's pretty common. And I think you guys can understand a lot of the migrant cases we do, if we, uh, if we uh, announced our visit ahead of time, you know, all the undocumented workers would be gone and, and we wouldn't catch them. So they may just show up someday and show their badge. And they're going to want to see records and say, hey, how do you pay the folks? Uh, can you show me your payroll? Uh, the stuff Jan was talking about, if, you, if you're paying in kind, you're going to have to show that. Then they interview employees. Because what they have how many hours do you work what do you do here you know what's your job uh, and then uh, if everything's in order you know you're more or less advised that and we're on our way and leave some publications with you and we're and we're gone if not then then um, you know we're going to talk about the back pay but our number one goal is if somebody isn't doing it right to change their their procedures to make sure they're doing it right so if you had someone that should have been paid minimum wage that wasn't, we're going to say immediately you need to start doing that. If you had a teenager employed in some arena they shouldn't have been, we're going to tell you to stop. Uh, and then going forward, if you owe back pay, we're going to supervise the payment of that or, or uh, could issue a fine against the uh, against the employer, you know, if it's, a, if it's a child labor violation. So uh, it pays to be up to speed, you know, on the rules. And every investigation is handled basically the same in the same fashion, so no one's treated, you know, differently than, than anyone else. So, um, should farms have a legal advisor? Wow, I tell you, I don't know if that's really a bad idea. I, I, it's probably not a bad idea. I know a lot of folks don't, but um, I don't know. Jan and Tim, what do you think? But, but I... I for, for once a year to have them just do a quick audit of, of what you're doing and stuff, I don't, I have no idea what the cost of that would be. But if it wasn't exorbitant, I believe it would be money well spent. So let Jan and Tim talk about the risk on their farm. Oh. Am I back on now? There we go. Okay. Um, yes, sir. I we have not hired a legal advisor for our farm, um, and I think you know from our perspective, we feel pretty comfortable with the resources and the time and effort we've put into researching um, what the requirements are. That we feel we're we're doing a pretty good job of meeting those requirements. So I I guess. You know, I don't know how to recommend to, to folks, but it depends really on how um, savvy you are and how uh, willing you are to spend the effort to review those materials that are out there um, and to really get your arms around what the requirements are. I mean, it's, it's pretty common sense materials, you know, treat the employees well, document, you know, you know say what you're going to do, document that you told your employees what it is you're doing. Um, and then have those keep those records to show that you met the requirements. Um, so it's it's you know it is doable. It is manageable to do that. I'd like to reinforce one thing Tim said. Tell them what is going on. I, it's unbelievable the number of complaints we get that that everything's fine. The employee or employees just didn't understand, you know, the pay practice or what was going on, and uh, um, you know, um, if if they know what the rules are ahead of time, then they really can't come back later and say, well, I didn't know, you know, that's what the rules were. Uh, document, document, document. Yeah, so I, I, that's a great point. Another comment I'll make is when you review that with the employee and make sure they sign the document, 
that shows you reviewed it with them. I mean, you can have the document, but if you don't have a signature from the employee that says, yeah, I reviewed, you know, and then the line that says, this has been reviewed with, and then have them sign their name, um, then you really have no proof that you actually went through it with them. So, you know, get that signature. And the employees, they're reasonable people. They're going to be willing to do that. Oh, yeah. And you never want, no, every once in a while you get somebody who says, this is the way it works around here, and they go, well, no thanks, I'm not interested. Right. And you're probably better right. off learning that at that point than later on, you know. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I see one more question about the investigation is their final report. You, we generate a report that goes in our case file. But we do so many investigations, we don't generate written reports to the employer. Now, they have a right under the Freedom of Information Act to get our report out of our file. Okay, so that's there. And in, in very uh, uh, complex, big investigations, once in a while, we'll give a report to an investigator. But it, it's simply a matter of we, we wouldn't do anything but be writing reports if we gave one to every single employer. But yeah, if, if somebody was really interested in it and they were subject to investigation, all they got to do is write a letter and 20 days later they get they get a copy of the report. And then I'm going to talk to the about the teenager one and then, then we'll go from there. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. If, if, if you know, your, one, your son or daughter brings a couple friends over and say, hey, mom, dad, we're going to pick a couple pumpkins and decorate them and take them out, you know, whatever. Hey, that's not employment. You haven't generated an employment relationship. But if you say to your son, geez, we've got to have these pumpkins picked, you know, very soon or this or that done, can you round up a couple friends and come over and help us for the afternoon? Well, then you've got an employment thing going on. You probably should get the parents, you know, permission. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking from a liability standpoint, it's probably not a bad idea. Again, I'm not an attorney, but it's probably not a bad idea. DOL-wise, you know, you, you need parents to sign permission for kids um, under the age of um, 14. So if they're 12 or 13, the 12 is the youngest they can work, but they can only work at 12 or 13 with written parental permission. Once they turn 14, they can work on your property without any parental permission whatsoever. So, Luke, is this question about a lawyer drafting letters, was that addressed, addressed to us? That's right. With, uh, the letters our employees sign. You mean like the agreement with the trainees that I mentioned? Yeah. Okay, no. Uh, uh, I don't think so. Um, I think I just designed that myself. I know that I built some of our trainee handbook off of a model that I saw at um, Harmony Valley Farm, Richard DeWild, um, quite a while ago. I think the agreement itself is home design. And I guess, again, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty basic, simply trying to, within the context of these legal issues that we've talked about, then just sort of capture that and put it down in writing you know, I draft it up, I go over it with them once they are here on the farm. We nail down dates because it lists when they start, it lists when they end, and then it has a place for them to um, uh, sign and document. And then when we do the different evaluation phases through the season, it's got check boxes. Did you talk about this? Did you talk about this? Did you talk about this? And then also places to date that. That's all on that same form. Okay, Mike here again. I'm looking at Luke's um, question he typed out about uh, the other big players as far as government agencies that exist. Um, yeah, I will work for us development is, uh, is unemployment, obviously wage hour is me. Um, Iowa's wage and hour, I think they actually go by Iowa Division of Labor, but, but you get the drift. Um, we handle some of the uh, immigration stuff, the I-9 forms, but um, well, you know, we'd mentioned DOL ETA if you're interested in those H-2A workers. And any time the, the immigration forms, the I-9s, that's all ICE, Immigration Control and Enforcement. They handle all that. So that's another one that might be out there. But I think, I think by and large, those, those are the ones. In theory, you might have an issue with uh, um, 
that Iowa Civil Rights Commission would come into if there's any discrimination allegations. Because as an employer, that's another thing you guys need to be aware of. And we don't deal with it. But there are rules against discriminating against people based on, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the named things. But, uh, you know, you don't have to pay every guy the exact same amount or every woman the exact same amount. If there's different levels of skill and, and ability and, and, and uh, experience, you certainly can pay people differently. Don't, don't fall into that misconception. And, and if you're ever called on it, you just want to say, I had a very good reason. This person has 14 years of experience working on a farm. This person just showed up from Chicago and they're trying to get some experience for the summer so they make less. You're going to be fine. It's when, they, when all the women are paid less or all the men are paid more or all the older people are being let go. Those are the kind of things that, that people get that feeling. Okay, now I'm going to look at this one. Um, you have, yes, that, that is true. Anyone that you're employing, even believe it or not, if it's your own family member, you have to, by, by ICE, you're supposed to fill out a, 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 a I-9 form, okay? Are we there? Okay, we are. <laughs> Jan and Tim, do you guys, uh, do you, are, is your farm big enough to be under the FLSA uh, regulations, the 500 man days rule? Uh, we're we were looking at that, and I don't know. I think we are like, if we are just under it, we're not terribly far under it. For us, the uh, what it comes down to is is how many days each week. Um, the majority of our employees are one day a week or two days a week. So to you know, over a quarter, you know, a calendar year quarter to add up the number of man days. Um, we don't, I think we don't have enough um, to actually qualify for that. May I add a point to that too? Um, when when sure. the regulation talks about a man day, that's any part of a day. If you have somebody come work, one person come and work for an hour, that's a man day. Mm -hmm. okay? Right. But so right. is somebody who worked 12 hours that day. It seems weird. but So you could have five people come and work five days for you in a week and weather or whatever, and they only worked an hour a day. You know, that's still five people working five days. That's 25 man days then for that one week. So uh, any of you that are look, trying to do that math or figure it out, keep in mind, uh, somebody shows up and works for you, that's a man day. Okay. What are your favorite uh, record keeping aids for all this legal responsibilities employers have? From from our perspective, well, I'll, I'll, we go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. From our perspective, we're using a lot of actual just paper forms. Again, the, again, Jan talked about the forms that we generate. Um, so we're using those paper forms. All of our uh, wage records, it's all Excel. Basically, we've set up spreadsheets that uh, show, you know, for the calendar sequence, you know, which day, how many hours, so on and so forth. So that's all in Excel because it's easy to, that way to add up the numbers and, and put in the formulas for doing the calculations. Um, I think those are the main things we use. So go ahead, Mike. Yes, well, um, you know, every employer, in, in and outside of agriculture, it seems like has a little different flavor for their records. But as long as it's something that, that is simple, don't overcomplicate it, easy for you to understand, and sometimes the employee, if you have to explain to them, uh, uh, legible, you know, and, and, and I go with Tim, Excel is, is an awesome tool. There's tons of payroll software out there. I mean, it's almost unlimited. I'm not even sure there isn't shareware out there. I'm pretty sure there is. You can get for free. I mean, for years, everybody was doing Quicken, but... but um, you know, you don't need to mess with that stuff anymore. But as long as you can maintain it, and that's the key, and keep it in, in a good spot for a couple of years until, you know, it's missed its time, then you let it go. So uh, 
those are the tips I would I would say. No particular form. We have time for one more question. If anybody out there has has it, give a few seconds to decide. And maybe while you're deciding if there's one more question, I'll thank our wonderful speakers. It's 8:30 already. You guys were very entertaining and uh, just full of great information and just wonderful preparation and. Very, very glad that uh, you, were, you were all able to be here. Thanks, Luke. Yes, thank yeah, you, Luke. Thanks, Luke. And thank you, Mike. Well, my pleasure. And I just want to emphasize again, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call us, you guys. I, I, I know how uh, difficult these things can be. Believe me, I do. And my wife used to own a business, so I've been on both sides of this. And, and it's tough, I know. And we're here to help you guys out, and you don't ever have to, to hesitate. So um, give us a call, and we'll do whatever we can to, to get your question answered and help you out. Join us next week for another Farminar. It'll be uh, on um, meat, meat marketing, uh, the family with a 30-acre farm in Massachusetts uh, totally revamped their business plan to uh, make their business viable on 25 acres. And they're going to be talking with a beginning farmer uh, in Iowa who has about 25-acre farm and uh, see what they can do to share wisdom on marketing for meat sales.